Good morning. Whether you're here in person or at home on the internet, welcome to worship at North Springfield Church on the 17th Sunday after Pentecost. If you're here in the sanctuary, please be sure that your cell phone is turned off. Thanks to all who helped with last Sunday's outdoor worship and picnic at Tadmore. There was a really nice crowd and lots of good food. A special thanks to our tech team for the sound, lights, and the live streaming. Uh, women's Bible study comes up on this Thursday at 1130 at Goodyear Heights Church, and you're to read Lesson 7. Oh. 
make sure. <laughs> it's, it's the next one. Um, women, um, next, sun, or next week, the adult Sunday school will begin again, also at Goodyear Heights, and it runs from 8.55 to 9.25 in their library. Uh, remember to help the church raise funds by saving your Acme community cash back receipts. We've gotten quite a few already, so it looks like we're going to have a, um, a really nice collection. And they've actually extended the amount or the time this year. So just as we have somebody here going through the parking lot and everything, if you see any, pick them up. Um, A uh, reminder that uh, next Sunday is the first Sunday of the month, which is a Worldwide Communion Sunday. We will also be receiving the um, Peace and Global Witness offering, and I will have a, um, and, and a, I will attend to that in a moment. But we also use our loose uh, offering on the first Sunday of the month for the community dinners. And our all-church birthday party for everyone in the church Sunday, October 15th, we're having a potluck after church, and we will be providing cake and ice cream. Yeah. All right. Um, if you look in your, in your, or you've seen, because it probably fell out when you opened your bulletin, for the Peace and Global Witness offering, this is just a little bit of an explanation of some of the things that the money goes towards. A reminder that 25% of your offering stays here with our congregation for our efforts for peace and um, global witness in our neighborhood. Last year, we used that offering for the community Christmas, the Santa shop. You have an envelope as well. There will be another envelope next week if you forget to bring it, and we will be collecting it. Bear with me here. Um, this Peace of Global Witness has um, a program that during the, the season of peace, they have daily reflections. And I'd like to read the reflection from today's offering. Pursuing peace is a requirement for those running the Christian race. In a world filled with violence, hostility toward the other, and disregard for human dignity, Pursuing peace violates social, political, and economic norms, even in America. The pursuit of peace requires compassion. We must consider the humanity of other people as well as the suffering of the environment endures, which we live, work, and worship and play, long enough to detect where painful predicaments exist. People are suffering because of the many isms that frame our collective existence. The environment suffers from the pollutants we emit every day. There is need, therefore, for Christians to walk with kindness and gentleness, consideration and love. The writer of Hebrews knew experiences like ours. Ancient Rome is known for its violence, its oppression of other peoples, and the way it destroyed many of the environments it inhabited. It is also known for its military might, its technological advances, and its brutal business and political leaders who put wealth and notoriety ahead of the human treatment of people, especially those whom it colonized and enslaved. The pursuit of peace is such a context set one apart from the norms of a society drunk on the intoxicating brew of greed and power. Per pursuing peace is seeking the well-being of other people. It is endeavoring to ensure that the needs of others are met. It is effort expended in the interest of the common good. It is when done in God's name, an act of holiness. Are there other announcements? Just a quick reminder that um, when I don't see very many people here that are in the choir, but if you are in the choir, we were starting rehearsal Wednesday at 1030. It was in the voice, so I hope everybody that isn't here read it. Um, we might have a situation that we're going to have to do some, uh, you might have to have some flexibility. Shantz is coming to turn, tune the organ at 9 o'clock Wednesday morning. They should be done by the time we start. If they're not, 
We may have to move down to Fellowship Hall so they can finish. Um, so 10.30 Wednesday for choir. Also, um, the meeting for the craft fair is scheduled for the 4th of October at noon in Fellowship Hall following choir rehearsal. I need everybody I can get because we have to move tables for that and I can't do that myself. So um, we, need, we need to find out who's going to help with it and Linda Williams, who is part of this uh, plan, is going to be here also for that. So I need uh, as many people as possible for, to be at that meeting to let me know what you can do. Thank you. As you're able, please stand for the call to worship. We come to praise our God. We are here to praise Jesus. We will praise the Spirit in these moments. Let us worship our triune God. Let us pray. You come to us again and again, generous God, no matter how late it is in the day or in our lives, calling to us and gathering us in. You give us your good work to do, daily bread and boundless grace. Increase in us a generous spirit so that we may do your work with joy alongside others whom you also love. We celebrate your salvation not only in our lives, but also in the lives of other people, even those we have not imagined would be included. Align us with your ways and help us receive your gifts of justice and mercy as good news. Amen. come to the font to remember that the font connects our confession of sin with the grace and cleansing of our baptism, with our baptismal call every day to new life in Christ. Like the Israelites in the wilderness, we have often been heard to complain. God is often blamed for calamities more than praised for the sustaining presence that works for our good. Trusting in God's mercy, let us confess our sins against God and our neighbors. We are people of the flesh, more than, more than people of the Spirit, O oh God. We admit our possessions when some people we deem unworthy benefit from your generosity. We confess our lack of attention to your guidance Silence. 
for personal reflection and confession. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Unlike us, God chooses not anger, but mercy. Not punishment, but peace. Not just what we earn, but more grace than we can begin to imagine. Now we know what the kingdom of heaven is like. Steadfast love, joy, and laughter. The life for which we have yearned. In Christ we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. As God has forgiven us in Christ, let us forgive one another. The peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. And also with you. Please turn to one another with words of peace, words of peace and reconciliation. And for those of you at home, the peace of Christ be with you. Gracious God, your word surprises, challenges, upsets, and overturns our way of seeing things. Come and find us today wherever we are, however we are. By the power of your Holy Spirit, cause that which is withering in us to blossom and that which is exacting in us to broaden until we see, you, see as you see and thereby glimpse the kingdom you are bringing through Christ our Lord. Amen. A reading from Exodus. The whole congregation of the Israelites complained against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. The Israelites said to them, If only we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the flesh pots and ate our fill of food, of bread. For you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Then the Lord said to Moses, I'm going to rain bread from heaven for you, and each day the people should go out and gather enough for that day. In that way, I will test them, whether they will follow my instruction or not. On the sixth day, when they prepare what they bring in, it will be twice as much as they gather on other days. So Moses and Aaron said to all the Israelites, in the evening, you shall know that it was the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt. And in the morning, you shall see the glory of the Lord, because he has heard your complaining against the Lord. For what are we that you complain against us? And Moses said, when the Lord gives you meat to eat in the evening and your fill of bread in the morning, because the Lord has heard the complaining that you utter against him, what are we? Your complaining is not against us, but against the Lord. Then Moses said to Aaron, Say to the whole congregation of the Israelites, Draw near to the Lord, for he has heard your complaining. And as Aaron spoke to the whole congregation of the Israelites, they looked toward the wilderness, and the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. The Lord spoke to Moses and said, I have heard the complaining of the Israelites, Say to them, at twilight you shall eat meat, and in the morning you shall have your fill of bread. 
Then you shall know that I am the Lord your God. In the evening, quails came up and covered the camp. And in the morning, there was a layer of dew around the camp. When the layer of dew lifted, there on the surface of the wilderness was a fine, flaky substance, as fine as frost on the ground. When the Israelites saw it, they said to one another, What is it? For they did not know what it was. Moses said to them, It is the bread that the Lord has given you to eat. The word of the Lord. Please join with me in a partial reading of Psalm 105, which is written in your bulletin. I'll give thanks to the Lord, call on his name, make known his deeds among the peoples. Sing to him, sing praises to him, tell of all his wonderful works. Glory in his name, let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Seek the Lord and his strength. Remember the wonderful works he has done, his miracles, and the judgments he uttered. O offspring of his servant Abraham, children of Jacob, his chosen one. Then he brought Israel out with silver and gold, and there was no one among their tribes who stumbled. Egypt was glad when they departed, for the bread of them had fallen upon it. He spread a cloud for a covering and fire to give light by night. They asked, and he brought quail, and gave them the blue food from heaven and the blood. He opened the rock, and water gushed out. It flowed through the desert like a river. For he remembered his stolen promise, that he would have been his servant. So he brought his people out with joy, his chosen ones with singing. He gave them the lands of the nations, and they took possession of the wealth of their people, that they might keep his statutes and observe his law. Praise the Lord. Our epistle reading is from Philippians. For to me, living is Christ and dying is gain. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me, and I do not know which I prefer. I am hard-pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary for you. Since I am convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with all of you for your progress and joy in faith, so that I may share abundantly in your boasting in Christ Jesus when I come to you again. Only live your life in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent and hear about you, I will know that you are standing firm in one spirit, striving side by side with one mind for the faith of the gospel, and are in no way intimidated by your opponents. For them, this is evidence of their destruction, but of your salvation. And this is God's doing, for he has graciously granted you the privilege not only of believing in Christ, but of suffering for him as well, since you are having the same struggle that you saw I had, and now hear that I still have. The word of the Lord.
church. I've been gone for a couple weeks, and um, I have to tell you, uh, you are all, and you, all of you and your smiling faces are a sight for sore eyes. <laughs> it's good to see you, good to be with you again. And um, I, um, I had a wonderful vacation, and I am ready to go. Okay, so here we go. A reading from the Gospel according to Matthew, the 20th chapter. Let us listen for what the Holy Spirit is saying to the church. The kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for the usual daily wage, he sent them into his vineyard. When he went out about nine o'clock, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace, and he said to them, you also go into the vineyard, and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. When he went out again about noon and about three o'clock, he did the same. And about five o'clock, he went out and found others standing around. And he said to them, why are you standing here idle all day? They said to him, because no one has hired us. He said to them, you also go into the vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his manager, Call the laborers and give them their pay, beginning with the last and then going to the first. When those hired about five o'clock came, each of them received the usual daily wage. Now when the first came, they thought they would receive more, but each of them also received the usual daily wage. And when they received it, they grumbled against the landowner, saying, These last worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us, who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. But he replied to one of them, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for the usual daily wage? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to this last the same as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or are you envious because I am generous? So, the last will be first, and the first will be last. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Let us pray. Gracious God, let the wisdom of your word Rain down on us today like manna and feed us, that we may be strengthened to do the work to which we are called, for the glory and honor of your holy name. Amen. The children of Israel were tired. They were tired and they were irritable. Moses had led them out of slavery and guided them onto the road to freedom. It was a great moment in their history, but now Israel is in the wilderness. And the wilderness is a really troubling place for Israel. There is a smell of death because they don't have what they need to survive. And so there emerges a crisis of faith. And as the children of Israel become acutely aware of inadequate food and water and life support, that in turn brings on not only a crisis of faith, but also a crisis of leadership. The Israelites attack the leadership of Moses and Aaron. The fear and anxiety of the Israelites distort their memories of the recent past. They seem to quickly forget about their oppression and abuse as slaves of Egypt. They only seem to remember the meat and the bread that they enjoyed eating every day. Likewise, today, in conflict situations where the stress levels run high in families and congregations in the world, in society, it becomes a convenient maneuver to glorify the past and demonize the present and the future, to rhapsodize 
looking backward instead of trusting the grace and will of God to proceed ahead and lead us forward. How easy it is to forget God's promises of grace to us in our baptism and to stray away and complain. Murmuring and complaining come naturally when we've lost our sense of purpose, when we're unclear about our goals and confused and fearful about our future. Jewish sages teach the truth of having clarity about purpose, meaning, and direction in order to avoid unnecessary murmuring with stories like this one. On a treadmill, several donkeys were harnessed to a big wheel, which they turned as they trotted around, thereby generating power. The donkeys wore blinders in order to block them from seeing that big wheel. Day after day, they kept trotting around and around, but the blinders attached to their bridles tricked them into thinking that they were going forward toward a destination. One day, the driver pulled off the blinders, and the animals went crazy. Even the dumbest animal, say the sages, cannot saunter purposelessly, going in circles all day and getting nowhere. In fact, the number one spiritual need in America today, according to a recent Gallup poll, is the need to find purpose and meaning and direction in one's life. But without much stamina, like children in the back seat of the car on a family trip, we, like the Israelites in the wilderness, ask, are we there yet? I'm hungry. I'm thirsty. When are we going to get there? And complaints against Moses are really complaints against God. How does God respond to the crabby, murmuring Israelites? With punishment or grace? With discipline or mercy? I think we all know the answer to that question. God graciously provides them food. Food from heaven. God gives them manna. And in giving manna, God demonstrates grace and mercy and generosity to a cranky and rebellious people. The Hebrew expression, man ha, which means, what is it, transliterates to the word manna. Manna is white, like coriander seed, with a yellowish tin, t- uh, tinge and resonance, appear- and resonance appearance and tastes like wafers made with honey. I understand it's pretty tasty. According to Numbers 11.8, it was ground in mills, beaten in mortars, boiled in pots, and made into cakes. This food of grace, this manna, becomes the food on which the Israelites mainly survived during their 40 years in the wilderness. Our reading today from Exodus lifts up this natural phenomenon of manna to the level of a sign confirming Israel faith. Here and other places in the Bible, manna becomes an amazing metaphor for God's grace and providence. The most important part of manna is that it's a gift that can't be hoarded. When people try to gather more than their share, the extra they have spoils and becomes inedible. With manna, Everyone has plenty, but no one has too much. In feasting on the word, Duke Divinity School professor Charles Campbell puts it this way. The leaders and servants receive the same amount. The people who work all day and the people who have little to do receive the same amount. The able and the disabled receive the same amount amount. Plenty, but not too much. And it's all a gift. The story becomes an embodiment 
of the Lord's Prayer. Give us this day our daily bread. The story of the manna God provided the Israelites in the wilderness reminds us of Jesus' parable of the workers in the vineyard or of the generous landowner in today's gospel reading. Jesus, like Moses, is seeking to create a new world order. He tells the parable to his disciples as they're trying to understand the reign of God within the old worldly framework rich and poor, superior and inferior, deserving and undeserving. And through this parable, this story, he tells them he wants to shake things up. Gets them to see, gets them, wants to get them to see with new eyes, to see the possibility of something new. He offers a new reality that was first introduced by God in the wilderness where everyone receives the necessary daily bread, which undermines the old distinction of rich, superior, and deserving. And of course, competition, which we know preoccupied the disciples and so often preoccupies us today. New Testament professor and Matthean scholar Warren Carter writes this about the odd and surprising payment to the workers in the vineyard. Instead of maintaining differentiation among the laborers based on performance, instead of reinforcing the superiority of some at the expense of the rest, the landowner has evened out the distinctions and treated them in solidarity as equals. Instead of using wages to reinforce distinction, he uses them to express equality and solidarity. Similarly, Catholic activist Dorothy Day also notes this subversive and unsettling use of wages. In this parable, she says, about those who came at the first hour and at the 11th hours, Jesus spoke of the living wage, not equal pay for equal work. A living wage for everyone, rather than the competitive struggle and inequality of the marketplace. Plenty, but not too much. This parable puts forth an alternative social order, just like the one that God envisioned and created out in the wilderness. It also exposes what was and still is so often the structure of social relations, winner and loser, superior and inferior, insider and outsider, honored and shamed. As Charles Campbell puts it, it unmasks an order that often encourages us to pray, give me this day my daily bread, rather than give us this day our daily bread. There is something very intriguing about this parable that so bluntly challenges the way which our society, the world's society, seems to be operating. You know, pull yourself up by your bootstraps. The Lord help those, helps those who help themselves. You know, the early bird catches the worm. Well, not in this parable. Maybe that's Jesus' point to the disciples and to the church today. Maybe Jesus is trying in a bold and radical way to tell us that the manner in which we operate very well may not be in keeping with the way God operates. And we would do well to notice it. God is in the grace business. God is in the business of setting right a a world that's gone haywire in many directions. We can all readily admit, often without too much prodding, that we're not worthy of God's love. And yet, God gives it to us anyway. We do not and cannot earn it, 
but still our God lavishes it upon us day after day. Like manna in the wilderness, God lavishes grace and love on others as well, even the ones we may not like, even those we deem inferior or those we believe are less deserving. You know, those who haven't worked as long or as hard as we have. Here's the thing, though. <clears throat> In the end, none of, us, none of us deserves God's love. But as Jesus teaches us in our gospel parable today, thanks be to our gracious and generous God, all of us receive it. In order that we may share it. Let us pray. Loving God, no matter <clears throat> what our bean counting and comparison sheets say, grace is your prerogative. So guide us not to be envious of others as they receive your generosity. Help us to truly understand that our work does not somehow make us better or somehow earn us a better place or prize. Because there is no person who is last or least in the kingdom of heaven. And for that, we give you all glory, honor, thanks, and praise. In Jesus' name, amen. My fault. That's what happens when you're away two weeks. <laughs> let, let us stand for our affirmation of faith, which is written in your bulletin. So sorry. <laughs> I believe in God. God.
We come before you in prayer today, O oh God, assured and comforted by the promise that when we do not know how to pray as we ought, your Holy Spirit intercedes for us with sighs too deep for words. The burdens and challenges of life leave us speechless. We thank you that even as we pray, Jesus prays for us to be one and strengthened for the ministry to which you call us. Let us pray. God of grace and God of glory, hear our prayers for your church in every place that we may, may bear faithful witness to your amazing grace in our lives and in the world, even when it offends our sense of fairness and our understanding of the way life ought to be. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. For the mission, ministry, and work of this congregation, may we always serve with a spirit of generosity as we depend on your gifts, rather than with a sense of scarcity that comes from looking to ourselves. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. For the gift of your good creation, may we be transformed into people who more deeply value and more diligently work to protect the earth, its plants, animals, and natural resources, so that generations who follow will be able to live abundantly and enjoy your wonderful works. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. For the peoples of this world whom you have created in your own image, for those who are in dangerous places through no fault of their own. Especially we pray for the people of Sudan and Ukraine. For those who have experienced disasters that have upended their lives. Especially we pray today for the people of Libya who have lost loved ones in the severe flooding. Thousands. And we pray for those in the U.S. suffering the effects of Ophelia. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. For those who are oppressed, enslaved, or addicted, and long to live as free people. For those who grieve. For those who are homeless or hungry and for those who are ill in mind, body, or spirit. Especially we pray for those in the prayer list of North Springfield Church, Church, for Kenny and Linda and her family. For Lorna and Terry and Rory. For Charlie, Marge and Bill. For Don and Kim and Rosemary. And for Melissa Cox. And we pray for those we now name in our hearts, either silently or aloud. for David and Cheryl as they travel, and for Jim as he is up here coming traveling. <laughs> and for Jim as he continues to get better. Lord, in your mercy, 
strength. Almighty God, help us to live lives worthy of the calling to which you call us. Remind us that we are the body of Christ. When one member suffers, may we all share the suffering and extend the loving care of Christ. When one member is honored, may we all rejoice together rather than be envious of another's blessings. Help us to live, love, and serve as faithful followers of Jesus Christ in your kingdom. Amen. Now with the confidence of the children of God, let us pray the prayer that Jesus has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. The Apostle Paul wrote to the Corinthians, For the rendering of this ministry not only supplies the needs of the saints, but also overflows with many thanksgivings to God. Let us bring our offerings to God, even as we present ourselves as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God.
to be steadfast, immovable, always excelling in the work of the Lord, because you know that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Now, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you this day and every day, your whole life long, and the people of God said,